It's over. The Trump administration ends special protections for 200,000 immigrants from El Salvador. We have reaction. A voice in Washington. Supporters of persecuted Christians and Muslims in Burma ask U.S. lawmakers for help. We're on Capitol Hill. Dreamers, fate. We talk to Attorney General Ken Paxton of Texas about the latest in the battle. And coos and cries in the Sistine Chapel. Pope Francis brings a few dozen noisy babies into the church. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, January 8th, 2018. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. The Trump administration is ending special protections for immigrants from El Salvador to legally live and work in the U.S. It's a program that's been in place for nearly two decades. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. Catholic Relief Services and Catholic Charities USA are a couple of the groups upset that the administration is canceling temporary protected status, or TPS, for Salvadoran immigrants. But no one is more opposed than the immigrants themselves who say they've built their lives here in the U.S. and they deserve to stay. Outside the White House today, a rally rejecting the Trump administration's decision. One protester says it will divide families. And that's not right and it's not fair. Immigrants from El Salvador received temporary protected status, or TPS, giving them the ability to live and work in the U.S. after a 2001 earthquake devastated their home country. Over the past 17 years, TPS for more than 200,000 Salvadorans has been repeatedly renewed, but not anymore. The Department of Homeland Security announcing the original conditions caused by the 2001 earthquakes no longer exist. Thus, under the applicable statute, the current TPS designation must be terminated. Now Salvadorans in the states have been given 18 months to figure out their future, after which time they could face deportation. We deserve to stay here. I spoke with Maria, a woman from Florida, who says she and her family call the U.S. home. They work, pay taxes, and have nothing to return to in El Salvador, where they say a corrupt government will only make life worse. Please, please, give us the chance to stay here. The Trump administration says Congress can still come up with a permanent TPS solution. Ana Sol Gutierrez, a Salvadoran and Maryland state representative, hopes lawmakers will work quickly to help her people. El Salvador is poverty. It is uh, violent. Uh, there are very little uh, economic opportunities. So I can assure you, that Salvadorians who have been here working hard are not going to uh, want to go. We have to fight to find a solution for them. There's a lot of Catholic reaction to today's decision. Bishop Kevin Van, chairman of the Catholic Legal Immigration Network, says it was ill-conceived and the Trump administration is ignoring the immense contributions of immigrants to the U.S. Catholic Relief Services also thinks terminating TPS will tear families apart. Lauren. But doesn't the White House also say that it's Congress's responsibility to take care of all of this? That's right, Lauren. I spoke with a senior White House official who tells me temporary means temporary. And it's not the responsibility of the executive branch to find a permanent solution for immigrants with temporary protected status. It's up to Congress. White House correspondent Mark Irons. Thank you, Mark. American activists are asking U.S. lawmakers to help end religious persecution in Myanmar, also known as Burma. Some 600,000 Rohingya Muslims have escaped, saying they are victims of genocide. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi joins us with more. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Lauren. Today I spoke to family of the victims. They tell stories of rape, destruction, and death. Several thousand Rohingya Muslims live here in the United States. They're urging the U.S. to impose full sanctions against Burma and to protect their people. They don't have nothing left. They just burn their house, their own. Mohammed Dean is a Rohingya Muslim who escaped Burma in 1979. Now he's joining other activists to demand action. The U.N. High Commissioner for Human Rights says the minority group is the victim of textbook ethnic cleansing by the Burmese military. That includes murder, widespread rape, and the destruction of houses, schools, and mosques. 
Last week, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson again listed Burma as a country of particular concern for severe religious freedom violations. Burma's been on that list since 1999. The country is nearly 90 percent Buddhist and only 6 percent Christian and 4 percent Muslim. The United States Commission on International Religious Freedom says the primacy of Buddhism at the expense of religious and ethnic minorities, particularly Rohingya Muslims, continues. But they're not the only ones. The bipartisan government watchdog also says Christians have suffered violent attacks on places of worship and an ongoing campaign of coerced conversion to Buddhism. If Rohingya can be subject to final solution that they are out of their land, they may try the same method on Kachin people or Shan people and Chin people who are Christian and some of them are Buddhist as well. That imam tells me Burmese leader and Nobel Peace Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi needs to force the ouster of the general leading this persecution or she herself needs to resign her post. The activists I spoke with today petitioned Congress to make sure Rohingya refugees aren't forced back to Burma without security and citizenship. The country considers Rohingya illegal immigrants. Lauren? Well, Pope Francis visited Burma in November. It's obviously an issue that is close to his heart. But when he was there, he didn't mention the Rohingyas by name. Did the activists talk about this? They didn't talk about it in their public comments, but I did ask one of them today what he thought, and, and he said it was an inconsistency that the Holy Father didn't use that term Rohingya in Burma. I know local Catholic leaders in the country worried that Catholics in the country would face reprisals if he did use Rohingya there, but the Holy Father did use the term in an emotional meeting with Rohingya refugees in neighboring Bangladesh. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi. Thank you, Jason. Vice President Mike Pence will travel to the Middle East later this month. He will visit Egypt, Jordan, and Israel January 19th through the 23rd. The vice president's original trip last month was pushed back due to violence in the region after President Trump recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And President Trump today heads south. He is in Nashville talking, to, talking farming and then to Atlanta to watch football. The president is promoting his tax overhaul to farmers. He plans to speed up federal permits to allow broadband expansion in rural areas. And he has a seat at the college football's national championship game between Bama and Georgia. Joining me now to talk about the administration and the president's possible 2020 competitor is Vince Colonnese, editorial director at The Daily Caller. Welcome back. Thank you. This weekend, the president convened Republicans mm -hmm. at Camp David, and the goal was to talk about 2018, and I'm sure they were doing a lot of high fives over tax reform. But looking forward, they have a couple of different options. First, they have to keep the government going <laughs> by yeah. January 19th, but then they're talking welfare, they're talking immigration, um, they're talking infrastructure. Which of these is the most politically expedient going into this election? Well, year? clearly getting the budget done, January 19th is the deadline for them to keep the government open. So they've got to do something there whether they like it or not. The things that are not expedient right now, it seems like welfare reform. The president's sending a clear signal from Camp David this weekend that welfare reform might stay on the back burner until next year at least. Uh, because they need to find some bipartisan consensus. Where they're getting consensus appears to be on immigration, uh, meaning they're at the table at least and having conversations with Democrats. At this point, not clear whether Democrats are willing to shut the government down over an immigration fight, but immigration definitely playing a huge role. This weekend, let's move on to Steve Bannon and the book written about the Trump administration, Fire and Fury. It came out last week. In the book, his former chief strategist described a meeting between Donald Trump Jr., senior campaign aides, and Russian lawyer as treasonous and yes. unpatriotic. Let's take a look at this apology that Steve Bannon wrote. It says in part, Donald Trump Jr. is both a patriot and a good man. My support is also unwavering for the president and his agenda. President Trump was the only candidate who could have taken on and defeated the Clinton apparatus. I mean, that's as big of a backpedaling as I've seen in a long time in Washington. Right. And he said that the men who were in the room, Paul Manafort, uh, Jared Kushner, and Don Jr. in the prior statement were the ones who were guilty of this treasonous behavior. Now he's saying it was just Paul Manafort I was talking about. But the, but the implication there is that he thinks that Don Jr. was too naive to have realized it was treasonous. Um, I don't think his backpedal or this so-called apology is going to accomplish what he hopes to accomplish, which is to get back in the good graces of the Trump White House. I don't think it's ever 
are going to happen. And according today to a press briefing um, on, I think it was in uh, on the airplane on Air Force One, uh, they said, you know, they were making it pretty clear. Uh, you know, you attack the kids. I'm sorry. I think you're gone. Yeah. All right. Let's go on to the last night, the Golden Globes. Yes. We saw Oprah Winfrey giving a pretty incredible speech. She was accepting the Cecil B. DeMille Award, passionate speech about race and the Me Too movements. And now celebrities are dubbing Oprah as our future president? Of course, Does yeah. this story have legs? Uh, yeah, it does, because it's Oprah, and anything Oprah touches or is involved with has legs. But I think here is kind of funny the hypocrisy of Hollywood, which is to say they spend so much time on that stage saying that Donald Trump is uniquely unqualified to be president because he lacks political experience and he was merely a star in entertainment. Uh, and a billionaire, that's Oprah's life story. So we'll see. We'll see if they stand behind, keep pushing her for president for 2020. Uh, we're seeing, starting to see some reporting already that she's even open to the idea. I've heard that, and it's trending on Twitter. And it, hey, so that it must trends on Twitter. Something. It must mean it's ha yes. something's happening. All right, Vince Colnese, editorial director at The Daily Caller. Thanks for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, Lauren. The Supreme Court declines to hear arguments in a case challenging a Mississippi religious freedom law. The law permits some businesses and government employees to cite religious beliefs in refocusing to recognize same-sex marriage. Critics say it allows discrimination against the LGBT community. However, there are provisions requiring valid marriage licenses be authorized in cases where the clerk is recused. Egypt's election commission says people will vote for president in March. Current president El Sisi has yet to formally announce his bill, bid, but is widely expected to run and win a second four-year term. More than half of the Iraqis displaced by conflict have returned to their homes. This is according to the UN. It reports that more than 3.2 million displaced Iraqis have gone home. 60% have housing that was only moderately damaged, and 2.6 million remain outside the country. Iraqi forces have regained, regained large parts of the country from the Islamic State since 2014. North and South Korean officials will meet face-to-face -to -face tomorrow for the first time in more than two years. The meeting is a breakthrough for the two countries, and there is hope it will open doors to broader cooperation. The delegations will meet in the demilitarized zone. Northern Ireland's largest Catholic diocese indefinitely suspends the sign of peace during Mass. The move comes amid an outbreak of the flu. Bishop Noel Trainer says doctors advised him to make the move. He also warns against distributing the precious blood. And the man who accused top Vatican official Cardinal George Pell of sexual abuse has died. Australian media reports Damien Dignan passed away this weekend after a long illness. Cardinal Pell is on leave from the Vatican to fight these allegations, which he denies. In Australia, without Dignan, prosecutors could end up dropping the case entirely. And Pope Francis is urging political leaders to put the dignity of their people before war, profit, or power. Que si possa sostenere ogni tentativo di dialogo nella penisola coreana. His remarks came during his annual speech to diplomats from 185 nations, among them Callista Gingrich, the U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See. Juliet Lindley is EWTN News Nightly's Vatican correspondent. She joins us from Rome. Juliet, what were the issues he covered? So Pope Francis this morning, he emphasized that world leaders should uh, prioritize the dignity of their people over power politics and war. As he spoke to the diplomats that represent the governments that have uh, diplomatic ties with the Holy See, he said that religious leaders around the world also need to just reaffirm that killing in the name of God is wrong. He said that fundamentalist terrorism is the fruit not just of social poverty, but spiritual poverty as well. And so he called on political and religious leaders to work together to, to defeat faith-based terrorism. The Holy Father, though, didn't mention the U.S. by name, but some Vatican watchers I read say his speech was an appeal to the Trump administration. Was it different than other messages from the Pope? Well, indeed, uh, a lot of the elements in his speech were related to the Trump administration. For instance, his call for universal health care for all or for his call for the integration of migrants, as well as uh, respect for international conventions relating to global warming, as well as calling for, you know, the, the, the status quo of Jerusalem to be respected and for a two-state solution 
to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Now, a lot of these issues, though, as well as you know, migrants, uh, poverty, humanitarian matters, they are recurring themes, unfortunately, Lauren, in the annual address of the Pope to the, to the diplomats to the Holy See. He also made reference to the nuclear threat in North Korea. Did he give advice? Yeah, indeed. He put uh, the threat of a nuclear war on the Korean Peninsula at the top of his global hotspots list, and he called for a serene, uh, all-encompassing uh, debate on disarmament. Now, you'll remember, Lauren, that at the end of last year, the Pope uh, hosted a very high-profile nuclear disarmament conference here at the Vatican, in which he called for an end for a destruction of the stockpiles of nuclear arms, and he also said that an atomic arms race is utterly unnecessary. All right, Juliette Lindley, EWTN News Nightly Vatican correspondent, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Coming up, the state of Texas. We talk immigration, DACA, and abortion with the state's attorney general. And across to bear, the faithful in Montreal brave freezing temperatures to mark a historic occasion. Taking part in the March for Life later this month in Washington, D.C. could knock some time off that you would spend in purgatory. The bishops of Washington and Arlington, Virginia, say Pope Francis approved a plenary indulgence for attendees of the march on January 19th. This year, the theme for the 45th annual March for Life is Love Saves Lives. You can read more about this, including what you need to do right now at catholicnewsagency.com. Officials at the University of New Mexico have suspended a faculty member for acquiring fetal tissue. It's been happening for months. A report in the Albuquerque Journal says a health services researcher transferred the tissue to a private research company in Michigan. Catholic groups are among those fighting a proposed assisted suicide bill in Indiana. The measure would allow adults diagnosed with a terminal disease that will end their lives in six months or less to receive medication to die. One church official says the bill allows doctors to assist in killing their patients and goes against a doctor's oath to do no harm. A bipartisan meeting on immigration policy is set for tomorrow at the White House. President Trump returns from a weekend retreat at Camp David where he met GOP leaders to discuss immigration reform. He's hoping for a deal with Democrats on the fate of young immigrants brought to the country illegally as children. But one fundraising group is telling Democrats to reject any bill that doesn't include protections for the so-called dreamers. Joining us now is Ken Paxton, Attorney General of Texas. Welcome back to the program. Hey, great to be here. Thanks. Let's talk about DACA. As Attorney General, you are focused on the law. But do you see any merit to the argument that dreamers should stay in the U.S.? Look, I think it's a legitimate argument. These kids have been here a long time, but I think it needs to be done the right way, which is Congress needs to make law about this, not the executive branch, not some agency, not the president. This is all about doing it the right way and following the Constitution. President Trump has said that immigration reform must contain some provision about the border wall. You're in Texas, right on the border. Why is that so important? Well, as Texans, we deal with crime every day from illegals. We've had over 600,000 reported crimes in the last six years. We've had 1,200 homicides. We've had sexual assaults. We deal with this on a daily basis. And so border security, wall, more border agents, better technology, we care about that because it affects our daily lives. Let's move on to abortion, an issue that our audience cares very much about. Late last year, there was an illegal immigrant who wanted to have an abortion. You filed to stop it, but it happened anyway. Give us some insight into that case. So somebody came across the border. They wanted an abortion. The ACLU and others tried to help them. The Department of Justice tried to stop it. It went all the way to the Court of Appeals in D.C., lost, but the DOJ was going to file with the Supreme Court and before that could get done. The woman had an abortion. So it's just an issue I know we're going to have to deal with in the future because Texas being on the border, we're going to become, if we don't deal with this, we are going to become a, basically a sanctuary state for abortion. People from other countries are going to be coming in. Is this their constitutional right 
to get an abortion. So we would argue no. You don't have a constitutional right. If you have no substantial ties to the country, you shouldn't have the right to an abortion. You shouldn't have any constitutional rights. And so this idea that somehow you can just cross our border and we're going we're gonna to let you have an abortion, to me, is, is not constitutional. And you fear copycats. Absolutely. I think it's going to happen over and over. It's already happened, you know, two more times, and it's going to happen in the future. If we open that floodgate, we're going to have all kinds of issues, what including, needs, including this one. What needs to happen? So the courts need to stop it. I mean, it's, that's where it's going to end up, and they're going to have to opine on whether it's, it's a constitutional right for somebody that comes across the border to have, have an abortion. And that go, will go to the Supreme Court? Do you, do Ultimately, you I would expect that to, that, that to happen. And the court is pretty divided, so that's where the rubber meets the road. Exactly, and that's why these appointments to the U.S. Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals and district courts really do matter. All right, thank you so much for joining us. Texas Attorney <laughs> General Ken Paxton. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Weather and climate disasters cost the U.S. $306 billion last year. That crushes the previous record of $215 billion. That was set in 2005, a year marked by the devastating Hurricane Katrina. 2017 saw Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria hit the U.S., followed by then wildfires on the other side of the country, including that largest blaze ever that California has ever seen. If last week's winter storm happened a few days 80, uh, 80 earlier, 2017 would have seen billion-dollar disasters in all seven categories tracked by the government. Nearly 300 Catholics in Canada braved temperatures of 21 below zero to commemorate a special day. The group carried a giant cross up Mount Royal outside of Montreal. It was a recreation of a march by a French soldier on January 6, 1643. That's when he placed a cross atop the mountain to thank God for sparing the city from devastating floods. Up next, a second Christmas. Orthodox Christians around the world celebrate the birth of Christ. And having an epiphany. Pope spends a busy weekend in church. We'll tell you his message for the faithful. Egypt President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, a practicing Muslim, attends an Orthodox Christmas Mass. He appeared with Pope Tawadros II, the Coptic pontiff. The president wanted to show solidarity with the country's embattled Christians. Fearing attacks by Islamic militants, tens of thousands of soldiers and police were placed outside of churches. The spiritual leader of the Orthodox Church marks the baptism of Christ with a traditional ceremony. <laughs> Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew throws a wooden cross into Istanbul's Golden Horn River. Nikos Solos, guess what he is, a personal trainer, was the first to reach it. His prize? A golden necklace. And finally tonight, Pope Francis tells parents it's their duty to pass on their Catholic faith to their children. His advice came during an annual event inside one of the Vatican's artistic jewels. Families gathered inside the splendor of the Sistine Chapel yesterday as Pope Francis baptized 34 cooing and crying babies. The Holy Father telling parents to make sure the language of love is spoken at home among fathers and mothers, grandfathers and grandmothers. With Michelangelo's frescoes looking down, the couples, some with other young children in tow, brought 18 girls and 16 boys forward. The Holy Father made the sign of the cross on the forehead of each child, recited their names, and poured baptismal water on their heads. Many of the parents are Vatican employees. On Saturday, the Pope celebrated Mass and prayed the Angelus on the Feast of the Epiphany. Francis challenged the world to help the poor and other needy communities. 
to give freely without expecting anything in return. Imagine having your child baptized, baptized by the Pope there. How lucky they all are. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. And we will end the show tonight with these images from the weekend's Feast of the Epiphany at the Vatican. Good night and God bless you.